from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. My name is Georgia Dorn, and I'm chief of the Hispanic Division. It's a great pleasure to welcome Kirsten, Kirsten Downey to the Library of Congress, where she's been a reader for several years. She's the daughter of a ship captain, so she traveled all over the world and has lived in many places, including the Panama Canal and Hawaii. She's, she's a student. She studied at Penn State University, where she became a journalist and worked for the Washington Post for 20 years. She shared the Pulitzer Prize with many others, with several others, for her story on the um, um, Virginia Tech horrible slaying. But lately she's been working on the banking system in the United States, which needs to be worked on very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great pleasure to welcome Chris Kristen to us. And the book is for sale afterwards. And it's a wonderful book. Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> Good. I'm delighted to be here today, and I'm, I'm very happy to see a number of my friends from the Library of Congress. I got so much help when I was working on this book from the Library of Congress, and it's really wonderful to reconnect with everyone who helped me along the journey. Uh, and I'd like to just say one really important thing about the Library of Congress, and that's that it is one of the seven wonders of the world. And we are so fortunate and blessed to have an institution like this here in our time and place. Um, and I don't think I could have written this book without the existence of the Library of Congress. Um, the collection is so vast and covers so many different countries' histories that I was able to explore many, many aspects of Isabella's life that I would have been unable to find in any other library in the world. And so I want to thank you. Um, those of you who work at the Library of Congress, would you please raise your hands? I want to thank you very much for your good work and the importance of what you do um, and how you make scholarship possible for so very many people. Now, I'm going to be talking to you about a really big topic today, um, uh, Isabella, the Queen of Castile who I have come to believe was probably one of the most important women rulers in European history, arguably one of the most important rulers, male or female, in world history. Her life had amazing and sweeping impact on everyone alive today. And one of the challenges of looking at her life is trying to understand the magnitude and the depth of all the ways this woman touched our lives. It's a historic topic, of course, writing a biography about Isabella, but it's also present in each day's news now. And her life was a reflection of what she saw as the core issue of her time, the clash between Islam and Christianity. Now, we have so much to cover today. I'm going to start with a couple preliminary thoughts that I'd like you to mull over during my talk. Then I'm going to do a short reading from the book. Then I'll talk a bit about how I came to write the book. And then I want to show you some pictures and maps that will help you visualize it all better. And then I want to make sure that we leave time for questions, because Isabella's life is a provocative and controversial topic. And I want to have a good bit of time for some give and take about it all. So here's the thought I'd like you all to start with. I want to remind you that up until about 250 years ago, there was no concept of a separation of church and state. In fact, that's the system that still exists in much of the Middle East today. That was the system that we had in the Western world as well at that time. Much of what Isabella did is understandable, not excusable, but understandable when we think about religion and politics from her perspective, that the government is the church and the church is the government. She felt it was her duty to defend and promote the church as much as to defend and promote what was to become the country of Spain. 
And in fact, one of the things that makes it so um, so poignant that we're here at the Library of Congress today is that it was in the United States 250 years ago that we as a nation first developed the concept of a separation of church and state. You know, remember that in Massachusetts, for example, in the first 100 years of the existence of Massachusetts, church and state were intertwined and everyone was required to pay taxes to support the church. That led to some really nasty incidents, like the witchcraft trials. We owe the concept of religious tolerance in the United States to the founding fathers, including, most significantly, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, who ultimately argued for specific protection for religion in the Bill of Rights. They wanted a specific separation of those two things, and in fact, at that time, they said they were influenced by what had happened in Spain during the Inquisition, which is part of the reason that we have a specifically protected uh, clause for religion. So let's start now, though, by setting our story and its time and place. In a castle on a steep promontory overlooking the windswept plains of north central Spain, a slender red haired princess finalized the plans for a ceremony that was likely to throw her nation, already teetering toward anarchy, into full fledged civil war. Her name was Isabella, and she had just learned that her older brother, King Enrique, known as El Enrique el Impotente, which symbolized his failings, both administrative and sexual, had died. King Enrique's lascivious young wife, who had occupied her time bestowing her favors on the other gentlemen of the court, had produced a child, but many people doubted that the king was actually the child's father. Isabella had decided to end the controversy over its succession by having herself crowned queen instead. The 23-year-old woman was essentially orchestrating a coup. No woman had ruled the combined kingdoms of Castile and Leon, the largest single realm on the Iberian Peninsula, in more than 200 years. In many European countries, it was in fact illegal for a woman to rule alone. On the rare occasions when women reigned, it was usually as a regent for a son who was too young to govern. Isabella had a husband, Ferdinand, who was heir to the neighboring kingdom of Aragon, but he had been traveling when the news of Enrique's death arrived, and she had decided to seize the initiative. She would take the crown for herself alone. On that bitter cold morning in December 1474, Isabella added the finishing touches to an ensemble intentionally designed to impress onlookers with her splendor and her regal grandeur. She donned an elegant gown encrusted with jewels. A dark red ruby glittered at her throat. Observers already awed by the pageantry now gasped at an additional sight. On Isabella's orders, a court official walked ahead of her horse holding aloft an unsheathed sword, the naked blade pointing straight upward toward the zenith in an ancient symbol of the right to enforce justice. It was a dramatic warning gesture, symbolizing Isabella's intent to take power and to use it forcefully. Acknowledging nothing out of the ordinary, Isabella took a seat on an improvised platform in the square. A silver crown was placed upon her head. As the crowd cheered, Isabella was proclaimed queen. Afterwards, she proceeded to Segovia's cathedral. She prostrated herself in prayer before the altar, offering her thanks and imploring God to help her to rule wisely and well. She viewed the tasks ahead as titanic. She believed Christianity was in mortal danger. The Ottoman Turks were aggressively on the march in Eastern and Southern Europe. The Muslims retained an entrenched foothold in the Andalusia kingdom of Granada, which Isabella and others feared would prove a beachhead into the rest of Spain. A succession of popes had pleaded in vain for a steely-eyed commander, a stalwart warrior to step forward to counter the threat. Instead, it was a young woman, the mother of a young daughter, who was taking up the banner. The means she used were effective but brutal. For centuries to come, historians would debate the meaning of her life. Was she a saint or was she satanic? As she stood in the sun in Segovia that winter afternoon, however, she showed no trace of fear or hesitation. Inspired by the example of Joan of Arc, who had died just two decades before Isabella was born and whose stories were much repeated during her childhood, 
Isabella similarly began to fashion herself as a religious icon. Inwardly infused with a sense of her own destiny, a faith that was fervent, mystical, and intense, Isabella was confident to her core that God was on her side and that he intended her to rule. The questioning would only come much later. People often ask a writer how long they spent writing a book. And I actually got the contract for the book in 2010. Uh, I looked back at my records at the Library of Congress, and I see I began ordering up books in 2008 on the topic. But in a sense, really, I've been writing this book all my life. Um, as Jordette mentioned, my father was a ship captain. He went to the Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, and then he went to sea. My mother and I would travel wherever his ships came into port the most often, so we traveled a lot. I remember uh, when I was first exposed to the significance of the Spanish Empire. I was six years old. We went to St. Augustine in Florida, and it was there that I saw my first Spanish fortress, the Castillo de San Marcos. I was fascinated by the architecture and what it represented, the thick walls to fend off attackers, the cannons facing outward to the sea for self-defense, tiny little cubicles where soldiers could sleep at night, how there seemed to be little or no concern for human comfort. I saw the adversity the Spanish conquistadors had endured, and I wondered about why they had been driven to go so far afield from their homes in Spain. Then my father was hired as a ship pilot for the Panama Canal Zone, which was great because this was the first time that we could all live together permanently as a family. And it was difficult to get to Panama in 1964 when we moved there. First we drove to New Orleans, and that took three days, and then we took an ocean liner to Panama. That took four days by sea, even then, and the ship was named the SS Cristobal, named for Christopher Columbus. So you see, you're starting to see that I'm starting to see some recurring themes already. On the day soon after we arrived, we drove through the jungles of Panama and out to the Caribbean coast, and we arrived at a forest that, a fortress that amazingly was a mirror image of the one I had seen in St. Augustine, 1,500 miles away. This one had the same thick walls, the same lack of concern for human comfort, the same spectacular setting, this time on a crest overlooking the Chagres River, which is the opening to the Panama Canal, of course, which became the path between the seas. It was remarkably similar to the fortress that we'd seen in St. Augustine. I think I began to realize at that time how vast the Spanish Empire had been, how powerful. I was a child of the Spanish, um, uh, of the American Empire then, which was then at its own apex. And it made me realize from a very young age that even awesome power can be fleeting. I attended Cristobal Intermediate School, again, Christopher Columbus, and I, la I later graduated from Balboa High School, <laughs> named for Fa Vasco Nunez de Balboa, the first European to see the Spanish, the, Paci the Pacific Ocean from the east. And that's about. 500 years ago now. Our home during that time was on the Atlantic side of the Isthmus at the entrance to the port of Cristobal. I like to go out and sit on the seawall overlooking the entrance to the canal. I think all of you probably as children had a place you loved to go and read, and that was my special place to read. My, I would dangle my feet out over the seawall, and it was right along that coast that Christopher Columbus had sailed in 1502. That was on his fourth voyage of discovery, when he was still desperately hopeful to bring back good news for the sponsor of his trip, Queen Isabella of Castile. So I'd look out across the sea, and I would imagine him there, anchored on Christmas Eve, 1502. And I would think then, too, how did he actually get here? I wondered about the woman who had sent him. She was only a line mentioned, Isabel and Columbus. She'd had some role, but then you but then historians quickly moved on to the story of Christopher Columbus, and Isabel was nothing more than an afterthought. And I started to wonder about who she was. Now, as you can tell, I was very interested in Spanish history. So I read the histories of the conquistadors. I read the stories of Indian rights advocate Bartolome de las Casas. I read stories about the Inquisition. I read about the reconquest and the expulsion of the Jews. And I read the many histories of Christopher Columbus. And I was always looking for an explanation of Queen Isabella, and I wasn't finding it anywhere. 
We traveled to South America on a vacation, and we visited Buenaventura, Colombia, Lima, Peru, and Santiago de Chile. Signs of Spanish dominion were everywhere. My childhood ended. The United States decided to return the canal zone to Panama, and we Zonians all had to leave. I went to live on the mainland United States for the first time in my adult life, and everywhere I saw more signs of Isabella's possessions in the New World. I went to California, and there I found San Francisco, San Jose, San Clemente, San Luis Obispo, Los Angeles, and San Diego. I went to New Mexico, and there I found Santa Fe. I went to Mexico, and well, it's Mexico, and everything's in Spanish. <laughs> Everywhere I went, I wondered about the Spanish colonists, and I wondered about Isabella. And I was amazed, and I became a little embarrassed for my fellow Americans that so many of them seem to have such limited awareness of the immensity of the impact of Spanish culture on the Americas. I went to Penn State. I studied journalism and Spanish art and history, and I went for a semester to the University of Salamanca, which I really loved, and where I learned much more about Queen Isabella. Then one day I took a train from Madrid to Salamanca, and I found myself on one of those very old one of those old trains they had in Spain that was very, very slow. I'm sure a number of you have taken those slow trains in Spain that they had before the wonderful trains they have now. We had a long layover in a remote and poor town called Madrigal de las Altas Torres. And so I took a little bit of time to walk around. It was dusty, unpaved streets, a poor town. And I remember that there were children in shabby clothes playing in the dirt by the sides of the road. And then I happened upon a brick wall in front of what was a rather unprepossessing two-story building. And I saw a little plaque on the wall. And it had been put there by a group of businessmen from Texas. It said that Isabella had been born in that building in 1451. Eureka. This was the queen that I was looking for. She had had so much global impact, and she had come from this town, from this unlikely place, and she had changed the world. I found this fascinating, and it only increased my interest in learning more about Isabella. I went into journalism. I worked at the Washington Post for 20 years, mainly doing business journalism. And finally, I got a chance to write a book, and it turned into my biography of Frances Perkins, called The Woman Behind the Deal, The Woman Behind the New Deal. And from that, I got another book contract, and at last, I got a chance and the time to fully explore the life of Queen Isabella of Castile. This is that book, and this is what I found. And I'd like to start by showing you some pictures and maps that will uh, help you to visualize more of these things. Uh, this is the cover of the book. Uh, it's an artistic rendition of Isabel uh, that we did from uh, historic paintings and uh, historic paintings of the crown that she wore. This is a map of Isabel during, of, of Spain during Isabel's time. You can see how it splintered into a number of uh, kingdoms which were often at war with each other. It was a very unstable place to live, um, very frightening. Uh, people mainly lived in castles uh, for self-protection. I want to set the backdrop a little further here. This is the Christian world in the year 600. You can see how far Christianity had spread, how far into Europe it had gone. This was the uh, this was the Europe and Middle East of the 600s. Muhammad was born. Islam spread very quickly. This is the Islamic world in the year 750. Within 150 years, much of the area around the Mediterranean Sea has gone from Christian control to Islamic control. And you see three of the old capitals of Christianity, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Antioch, are now uh, Islamic controlled. And of course, one of the things they had done is conquered Spain. This is Europe at the time of Isabella. 
down in the bottom of the boot of, Sp of Italy, you'll see the island of Sicily. Do you all see that? That, in fact, was the first country of which Isabel was technically the ruler. When she married Ferdinand, she became the queen of Sicily because he was the king of Sicily. So one of the things that you need to understand is that part of her worldview is anchored not just around Spain, but her sense of responsibility for the boot of Italy as well. Here we have a picture of Isabel um, reading the Bible with the Holy Family. Um, I show you that just because it's just very interesting. Um, most depictions of Isabel um, uh, show her uh, with dark hair and dark eyes. And in fact, she and all her family had red gold hair going to Auburn. And it's just interesting to see. Here are Isabella's childhood homes. Home sweet home. <laughs> Tells you a lot. This is the place where she got ready to take the throne. Look at how that's perched on a cliff. These are people who felt that they were under threat. This is the hall of the kings in the palace in Segovia, in the Alcazar. They're around the top of the, of, the, uh, of the room are niches for statues that Isabel saw as her ancestors for the last 24 or so generations. She considered her earliest ancestor in that lineup to be Palayo, who was a Visigothic warrior who had fought the Muslims when they had invaded Spain. So she sees her lineage as 24 generations of fighting to reconquer Spain. Every decision that she makes, her ancestors are looking down on her. Ferdinand and Isabel. Isabel's daughter, who was considered to be the one who was most like her, Catherine of Aragon who married Henry VIII. On the right is Isabel's daughter, Juana, who became the next queen of Spain after her mother died. She's married to Felipe the Fair. Felipe had quite a wandering eye. So did Isabel's husband, Ferdinand. And you can see in this picture, he's already sort of taking a glance around. <laughs> <laughs> you can see she doesn't look happy. <laughs> I'd say this is one of the most telling paintings I found, uh, depictions of Isabel and her family. And when I found this painting, I was amazed and incredulous because it tells you so much about the psychology of Isabel. Many of us over the years have seen many pictures of royal families, often royal families uh, with uh, religious figures. What's different with this is, Isabel and her family, you see there she is down there with Ferdinand and three of their children. They're being guarded by the Virgin Mary and they're actually being menaced by demons. This is a woman who was very afraid. This is what she was afraid of. This is the expanding empire of the Ottoman Turks between 1451 and 1574. All those crossed swords represent major battles that occurred. Um, the big, uh, the big and most important uh, battle that affected Isabel the most was that um, uh, Constantinople, the ancient home of Christianity, fell to the Turks in 1453 when she was two years old. Um, and she, and uh, the Turks <coughs> promised that they were going to conquer all of Europe. She took that threat seriously. And you can see by all the battles that were fought in the next 150 years that it wasn't an idle threat by the Turks. This is the particular person she was afraid of. His name is Mehmet the Conqueror. Um, and it has been estimated that he killed 29,000 people a year during his time on the planet. Uh, here is a contemporary portrait of an attack by the Turks on a Venetian city. Um, one of the things that they would do is uh, capture um, uh, Christian and Jewish women and uh, sell them into slavery. Um, this is an interesting picture in itself. Um, the woman who's being carried away here, you can tell is a noble woman because she's wearing a red silk dress. Uh, red was very expensive dye at that time. That tells us she was a noble woman and you see her getting dragged away. This was something that was a very real threat and fear at that time. 
So Isabel decided that she needed to throw uh, the Moors out of the south of Spain. And she did it from this perch, a fortress in Cordoba. This was her base of operations. She and her family went to live there while she led troops for 10 years into battle. These were some of the towns they had to conquer. It's the town of Ronda. They besieged it. A lot of the uh, Moorish cities as well were heavily fortified, um, and it was very difficult to conquer them. Uh, Isabel commissioned a series of 20 uh, carvings to commemorate the battle. They were all scenes that happened during the course of the war. Um, she commissioned 20. They're the seat backs. They're the, the backs of the choir stall in the, in the, in the cathedral in Toledo. Um, and they are the scenes from the war painted, uh, carved during the time of Isabel's lifetime. Um, and so at first she thought she commissioned 20. She thought the war would soon be over. Then she had to commission 20 more because the war went on longer. And ultimately there were 54 separate battle scenes depicted. In, these, in the choir stall chairs. Um, I picked this one in particular. It's very interesting. Um, it's a suicide attack um, by a Moorish soldier attacking people he believes to be Ferdinand and Isabella in their encampment. Um, the attack didn't succeed. But you can see how they uh, set themselves up in tents outside the city walls to conduct these wars. Um, this is another kind of startling image that you have to go looking for in Spain. Um, this is the Church of San Juan de los Reyes in Spain. It's in Toledo. This is the church that Isabel commissioned to celebrate her triumphs. Um, you'll see some things hanging off the walls there. Can anybody tell me what those are? They're chains. They are the chains that were moved from captive Christians that were freed uh, in cities after the um, uh, Spaniards defeated the Moors. They found thousands of Christians in captivity in Andalusia. This is the beautiful city of Granada, really one of the most spectacular places in the world. And it's a place where you can really see the majesty and the artistry of Islamic art. If you haven't been there b before, I really suggest you go. It's very beautiful. Um, in a lot of ways, it's the culmination of artistic traditions, Jewish, Christian, and, and Muslim, and it's well worth a visit. But you can also see that it was a difficult place to try to conquer. Uh, here is a Romantic era painting in the 1800s of Isabel accepting the surrender of Granada. Uh, Isabel also commissioned some s sculptures, wood, wood carvings that were uh, in other places. This one is in her, in her burial place in the city of Granada, which is where she's buried. Um, I selected this one because it's really important to you to see. One of the reasons that she was able to get um, the Muslims in the south of Spain to, in many cases, agree to surrender was that she told them that they could keep their religion. She did not keep that promise. Um, and here you see some heavily veiled Muslim women being forcibly converted and baptized. This is a very dramatic scene showing the expulsion of the Jews. Um, the Jews were amazed and horrified when this expulsion order came down. They had not been expecting it. Uh, many of them had many, uh, there were many Jewish families that had that were high ranking in Spain and she and and they viewed her as friendly to them and then suddenly this edict came down and within just a brief period of time everyone had to go Isabel had decided that having Jews in the kingdom of Spain uh, of her in her kingdom was making it hard to maintain the loyalty of people who had been Jewish who had converted to Christianity and she thought, thought if they left she would turn Spain into a bastion of Catholicism, which she did. But obviously at some human cost to people who loved and cherished their own faith and wanted to keep it. This is one of the examples of all the problems that came as a result of the Inquisition. And 
Isabel really is responsible for launching the Inquisition. She was the queen at the time that it happened. Uh, later on, her children, in fact, in the in the statue niches in Segovia now, uh, when you go there and you see the statues of Isabel and Ferdinand, um, her children later wrote that Ferdinand was responsible for creating the Inquisition, not Isabel. But the fact is she was the queen, the fact is she was responsible. And what she unleashed was something that was horrifying. Um, it was a way of controlling how people think, how people feel, their faith, and ultimately how they think on all other things politically as well. Um, she had set something very bad in motion. Initially the intent was to clean out heresy, to get rid of people who were heretics, um, but it ended up being a political tool that could be used against anyone who was a wrong thinker. So in this case, this is her very beloved confessor, Fernande Talavera. Um, he was a converso. He was a Christian of Jewish descent. Um, he was widely viewed as one of the holiest men in Spain. Um, she had assigned him to become the um, the Archbishop of Granada to help with the conversion, but after she died, he was subjected to the Inquisition himself, and as a very old man, he was stripped naked and beaten in the streets of, uh, of, uh, of, of Seville, um, in, of Granada, in, in something that you could only say was that this terrible political tool had been set loose that could be used against anyone. Now this is Christopher Columbus. And you all know about Christopher Columbus. Um, he made four trips to the Americas and traveled quite a bit around the Caribbean. This map that I commissioned, though, is a little different, and I'd like to draw your attention to it. One of the things that became apparent to me as I did my research is that, in fact, Isabel was commissioning re multiple trips to the New World. In fact, she commissioned nine separate trips to the New World before, between 1492 and 1504. And here you can see what the different voyages are and where they went. In fact, she had sent people to explore the entire coast of the Caribbean and all the way down into Brazil. How did she then decide that she could claim all this land for herself? <laughs> this is how. The man in the picture is Pope Alexander VI, the Borgia Pope. Rodrigo Borgia was his name. He'd been born in Spain, and he was technically a subject of her husband. That meant that he liked to please Isabel and Ferdinand. And so when Columbus came back from his first trip and sent fast horses to Isabel to tell her what he'd found, she quickly sent fast horses to the Vatican and said, I claim it all for myself. And the Pope said, OK. So in fact, all the Americas got named, got, were, were proclaimed the possession of Isabel as Queen of Castile and Leon. This is a really interesting structure. Now one of the things that's fascinating about Isabel is this combination in her of both a person who is closed-minded, which we've seen religiously, and open-minded in other ways. A really interesting combination of things. She was very interested in art very interested in architecture. And one of the um, things that's very interesting is that Ferdinand and Isabella, in fact, commissioned the Tempietto in Rome, um, which is considered one of the masterpieces of early Renaissance architecture. Um, after the Borgias um, uh, died away and after Ferdinand and Isabella were gone, um, the Italians were very irritated that the Spanish had had such an important role in Italy for so long. So they sort of began to erase the history of Spain in Italy. And I think this is one of the fascinating examples. You'll read a whole books about Bramante, you'll read a whole book on the Tempietto, and maybe not more than a mention that it was sponsored and funded by Ferdinand and Isabel. And this, does anybody know where this statue is? It's in Washington, D.C. It's a it's here in our own town. It's outside of the Organization of American States. It's a monument to the woman who is the mother of all the shared cultures that are represented in the Organization of American States. And I'd just like to tell you, I'd just like to name for you the members so you get a sense. Remember, they all, they commissioned the statue out there. This is their shared heritage. 
Argentina, the Bahamas, Barbados, Bolivia, Brazil, at least to some extent Canada, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guamata, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Jamaica, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, Venezuela, and the United States. Not a member of the Organization of American States, but a cultural brother, is the Philippines, which was also a Spanish co colony for many years. So that's the thing that's really incredible about this woman, who is only just a name that we heard mentioned in the epic story of Columbus. She exported her culture everywhere. Today, because of Isabella, some 470 million, on the million people on the planet speak Spanish as their native language. It's the second most common language on the planet after Mandarin. And about 2 billion are Christian, making it the world's largest religion. Much of that came from Isabella's zeal to spread the faith. The world is much different because this one woman lived. And now I'm happy to take your questions. Yes. But if you read the, the context, the historic concept of us, and all the papers and the testament, she wasn't, she wasn't Catholic. So there's no such a thing as concept as Christianity back then. She, and this was A to Z. Have you, or do you use the, the concept of Christianity in a way to uh, adequate the language to the era that we're living? Um, well, the the split in Christianity that was the biggest split in her lifetime was this, the split between Roman Catholicism and Orthodox Christianity. And in fact, that was part of the reason that the Eastern side of the Roman Empire fell so much, is there was like a Sunni Shia thing going on in Christianity um, with the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics uh, not supporting each other and in fact not helping each other. And when Constantinople fell, most of, the, of, the, of Western Europe, although they were all Christian, felt like it was the problem, not their problem. So um, I guess one of the problems of every religion, including Christianity, is that question of which is the original, which is, which is the original, which is the new and improved, which is original Coke, and what's new Coke? <laughs> so you raise an interesting question, in fact. Um, uh, Protestantism didn't arise until after she was dead, and that's a whole other form of Christianity that emerges as well, um, and something else that uh, her family felt that they had the duty to fight. So variations on Christianity are, are definitely a theme in Isabel and her family. It's nice. Yes? Uh, when Isabella claimed um, uh, claim herself queen, um, how, did, how did she do that? I mean, did she need funding to get the right people to support her, or, or how did she just march into the square? Well, she had sort of systematically done an outreach. Ferdinand was really a brilliant stat. He was, he was cagey and brilliant. And they had sort of systematically put the pieces in place over a long period of time, both undermining her brother, um, under, undermining her brother's child's claim to the throne. We'll never know if that child was, in fact, the legitimate heiress to the throne. Um, well, I suppose perhaps someday if someone did DNA testing, I don't know, but the families are so interrelated it would be hard to tell anyway. <laughs> um, but we, we don't really know. Um, but she organized a base of support. Among the, her uh, most stalwart supporters were uh, Jewish merchants. And so that was part of the reason that they felt that she would never turn on them and that they were so distressed when she did and felt so unfairly treated. Yes? Wasn't her marriage to Ferdinand kind of a strategic move on her part and against the wishes of her brother? Yes, indeed. The question was about her marriage to Ferdinand. Wasn't it a sort of strategic move on her part? Yes, in a lot of ways it was. And in that era, women were really just pawns. You know, princesses were just pawns to be married off 
for political alliances um, for the most part. And Isabel refused to submit to that when her brother tried to assign her in marriage to the King of Portugal um, and some other people, but in, in particular the King of Portugal. She did not want to marry him. He was older than she was. He already had a family. There was already an heir. She would be a queen whose children would never reign. Uh, on the other hand, there was Ferdinand. She was 18. He was 17. She thought a 17-year-old looked a lot better than a man in his 30s. Funny how that's still the same. <laughs> anyway, um, but also there was some, you know, he was also her second cousin. So she sort of knew him already. And they were preparing to, it was a, a strategic alliance. It allowed them to merge Aragon and Castile. Uh, initially, Ferdinand thought that he would have the upper hand in the relationship. Um, he was shocked and horrified when she took the crown for herself alone and then said, oh yeah, and he, he is too. Um, so there were a lot of strains in the marriage. Um, the way she wrote her will, you can tell that she passionately loved her husband. But it's also quite clear that he was not a one-woman man. And there were many women in his life. And uh, he remarried very quickly after she died. Um, so he seemed to have moved on. Um, one of the things, though, is that if she hadn't married, it's questionable whether she would have been able to continue to hold power. She needed to be married for strategic reasons and also because of gender discrimination reasons. It wouldn't have been viewed that a woman could hold the throne by herself. So one of the things that she did from the very beginning is be very strategic about making it appear that Ferdinand was making more of the decisions. So chroniclers remember that she'd write a letter to somebody, and then when it was done, she would say to her chronicler, oh yeah, put Ferdinand and Isabel on that. So she did a lot of things that put Ferdinand more in the forefront than he might have been otherwise. We don't really know for sure. It's a little hard to tell. But what we can tell about the difference between Ferdinand and Isabel is that Isabel did many things that have withstood the, the test of time, and Ferdinand's life after the end of her reign is sort of an afterthought in history. Yes, Did you find anything here that you didn't find anywhere else about Isabella? Oh, yes. Actually, that's a wonderful question. Uh, did I find anything here at the Library of Congress? Well, I'm an independent scholar, and that's really hard. It means that you have to find ways to support yourself while you do your work. And when I go to do research, it's very difficult and expensive for me because I have to take time away from work. Uh, to do it. Um, so obviously taking on a book like this was, was very, was very, a huge, huge task, expense and time. Um, I went to Spain and I spent some months in the Biblioteca Nacional and in the uh, Royal Archives. And I found some wonderful material there. I found so much material that at the end of three months I found myself crying in the Biblioteca Nacional in Madrid because there was so much I hadn't been able to get to yet. And I suddenly had an idea. And that was that I sat, went and sat down at their computer room in the, in the National Library in Madrid. And I decided to pull up the Library of Congress website. And I had a list of about 300 things I had been wanting to look at in Madrid. And what I did is I methodically went through that list. And I found that we had 2 thirds of them here at the Library of Congress and I could spend my last week just doing the things that I could only find in Spain. Our collection of Spanish materials are, is incredible. One of the things that was also very fabulous is that Isabel was born at a time that the printing press had just been invented. Because of the wealth and importance of her reign, a lot of her correspondence was put in early published books. Those are books that you have here at the Library of Congress. So I was able, um, if any of you have tried to see, or try to read writing from the 1400s, you have to be very trained now to be able to read writing from the 1400s. It's a very rare skill. And in fact, I just learned at Mount Holyoke that they're having a problem because now children can't read cursive, okay? <laughs> so they're having to have um, alumni come back and start to transcribe the letters that they have in their collection or they're going to lose the ability to know what's in the letters. And I can, I can vouch for that. There's, there are now letters that are almost unreadable to us because we don't have people that can read 
that archaic form of Spanish. Um, but luckily, the things were published in these books, and I was able to use rare books and manuscripts over and over and find copies of volumes. What I would do is I would take these books, um, and uh, a lot of them had been republished like in the 1800s and 1900s in reprints, um, sort of at the end of um, the Spanish Empire. And I would photocopy them, and then I would translate them on the sides, which was how I, I did the work. And then um, I also found in Spain a book that I was actually able to find here at the Library of Congress, which was a bibliography to all the books that had been written about Isabel and her times. And I saw a reference to a book that they said had been a history of Spain that Isabel had commissioned called the Cronica de España, and uh, that there was a copy of it in Madrid. And I was thinking, oh no, this is, I'm going to have to go to Madrid, I'll have to go get it at Rare Books, I'll be able to look at it a couple hours a day, I won't be able to do it, it's going to be so awful. I started Googling around on the Library of Congress website, and it turned out there were three copies in existence of Diego de Valera's Cronica de España, and one of them is in Rare Books. It's a book that Isabel commissioned, and that according to the writer that she helped to edit, and it gives us Isabella's worldview on Spanish history, what she saw as the events that happened that were important in her history. And that was amazing because when I found that, I realized how much Greek and Roman mythology and Christianity were blended in her mind. To her, stories of Hercules and stories of Noah had equal weight. She believed them both. And it really shows the Greco-Roman heritage. That was a wonderful find, and that was because we had it at Rare Books here at the Library of Congress, one of many, many special books I found. I also, my studies took me a great deal of field. Um, as I was going through the, um, the uh, Royal Archives in, in, um, in Madrid, I saw a lot of references in the correspondence to cities that I didn't know what they were. Uh, Scutari, they kept talking about Scutari, and I didn't know. Other cities, they were Venetian cities that fell to the Turks and that were then renamed. And so they were accounts of what information was being sent back to Isabel about what had happened in the countries where the Turks seized control. And those accounts, I was able to go to the histories of those various countries and go back through the histories of Hungary, Albania, uh, Yugoslavia, uh, Crete. I was able to find, we have all the histories of all those countries, and I could find those accounts, and I was able to find that Scutari had been renamed Shkrodra, and Shkrodra, there was a, an account of the fall of Shkrodra that was written in Albanian that had just been translated since the Iron Curtain fell into English for the first time, and the events that Isabel was describing, or that had been described to Isabel, I found in contemporary accounts that I was able to track back to historic books that I found here at the Library of Congress. Yes? Did Isabella live in the Alhambra after she conquered it? Uh, yes, she did live in the Alhambra. Wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she did. Yes. And, uh, of course, the Inquisition was bad from the beginning, but it quickly became much worse. Uh, presumably not under her, because uh, apparently she believed that people could convert. Yes. That she had her confessor. And, and yes. afterwards, uh, right. the Inquisition went out. Right, that's right. After, after that, it became a way to go after people who had any kind of wrong thinking, like, did you ever say that you didn't believe in the virgin birth? Oh, you're gone. Okay, so there would be, this could be expanded to Protestants, to gays, to people who are considered bigamists. That's if you divorced, tried to divorce and marry someone else, you're a bigamist, then you could be burned. That's also, you know, breaking church law. So it was expanded in a lot of different ways. Um, actually, what she was really trying to do is force everyone in Spain to convert to Catholicism. That's really the goal here, was what she was trying to do, forced. Um, I think, no, she wanted them to convert 
wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. And if, you know, it's the people that were killed in the Inquisition weren't Muslims or Jews. They were people who had been Jewish, whose families had been Jewish, who had converted, but that she believed and that many people believed, and now many Jewish scholars also believe, had not wholeheartedly converted. Her thing was, are you on my team or not? And it's, and if not, you're going to fry. And it's harsh, it's horrible, it's unimaginable. Um, it's estimated that between one and 2,000 people were killed by the Inquisition during her lifetime. Um, not as many has been sometimes estimated, mm -hmm. but I think one burning at the stake is too much, don't you? <laughs> yes, over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, okay. meaning that there was religious motivation. Yes. Um, but taking into account that the siege of Granada took so long and involved mercenaries yes. every single year, um, don't you think that you could ascribe the expulsion of the Jews to some degree to uh, an economic motive? Uh, it's not clear whether there was an economic motive or not. It's clear that there was an economic motive for Ferdinand, because in the Kingdom of Aragon, the properties that were seized uh, from con conversos and then later from Jews went into the hands of the crown. Um, in Castile and Leon, in the lands that Isabel controlled, it's not so clear that monies that were obtained from the Inquisition and from the expulsion were used to enrich people. I know in one case it was used to fund a hospital. So money was taken and expropriated. Um, but um, in fact, Isabel said that she thought she had done damage to her country economically by expelling the Jews. So she knew that it was injurious economically. Um, but she was convinced that Spain could only survive if it had only one faith, and it was her faith. And that's what she set out to do. Question here. Who or what do you uh, attribute to this drive of hers, this uh, passion for religion and, and the uh, exploration and even the uh, <coughs> educational um, free ride of history, if you will. Right. Where, where did all this come from at such an early age? Well, it's really fascinating. I guess that's sort of that whole concept. I guess it was, I guess you're asking sort of about the, the many things she was open to, had her mind open to, exploration, education. Right. Um, Did she have mentors, or was it the church? Uh, she was, she grew up in a very unstable environment, and the people that were the most reliable and stable people in her life were religious people priests and nuns, and she put a huge amount of faith and trust in religious people to be doing the right thing. Um, and in fact, they may have been like a source of stability to her in what had been a very frightening childhood. Um, she was a huge proponent of female education. Um, she felt like her own education had not been good enough, and so as an adult, she set out to, uh, to uh, teach herself uh, to, to be taught Latin, which was, of course, the language of international diplomacy, which a ruler had to be able to, to read and write Latin. Um, and uh, so she was very, um, very, very firm about how good the education of her children should be. So her daughters were among the best educated women in all of Europe. And in fact, Erasmus said that he thought Catherine of Aragon's education was better than Henry VIII's. Um, and that became the new standard for female education then that was um, common in Spain and also common in England. And then, of course, moved across to New England. Um, so, in fact, in a lot of ways, um, she introduced a new standard for female education that I think has made a big difference for a lot of women today. Um, as far as the exploration, why was she so open to it? She was half Portuguese. Her great uncle was Henry the Navigator. So she grew up knowing from the very beginning that there were some really there was some really great stuff out there, you know, that you just had to get out there and get it and grab it, and that you could get and grab stuff, and by claiming it, people would believe that you owned it. 
And so that is exactly what she did from a very young age. She realized the, the potential. Uh, part of it was that she wanted to convert all the people in other lands to Christianity. So part, a big part of her motivation was religious. Um, there was also a desire, you know, for uh, economic. This one clearly had an economic motivation too. She wanted to find a route to the silk, to the silks and spices of Asia, without having to go through the Ottoman Empire to get it. She wanted a separate route through there, um, and then, of course, eventually the Spanish obtained that. And Isabel was a hundred years ahead of any other ruler in recognizing the significance of the discoveries in the Americas. Oh, here, yes, yes. Putting back your hat as a business journalist. Yes. Why do you think Columbus got all the press? You know, why has he been held up? And, and well, uh, uh, the question is why has Christopher Columbus? Well, there's no question that what he did was really scary. You know, I mean, it was, I, I wouldn't want to do it. You know, it sounds really scary to me. And I mean, everybody was, you know, on the on the edge of mutiny as soon as they got out of the sight of land. There's a reason that the Portuguese explored around Africa like this. People didn't want to go out of the sight of land. And what he did was audacious. And what he did was important. And he wrote a lot about it. His journal survived. It's a very vivid tale. It's a first person account. It's 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 science fiction. It's the encounter, the encounter between cultures. It's when it's first contact, um, and um, and so there's a, a very powerful element of it in that. Um, but there is also just something where people have a great deal of difficulty recognizing the sig significance of things women do. Um, they will, they want to give the credit to any man around any woman. <laughs> and so I, the thing that's just, when, when um, the first uh, people in Europe realized, for example, how important these discoveries were, and when Isabel, and when um, Columbus came back and his journal first circulated around Europe, it was translated in a number of languages. So there's always, so every now and then you'll hear somebody foolishly say, oh, he just went over there and got lost. He didn't know what he found. No, they knew what they found was very important. It wasn't what he wanted it to be, but he knew what he'd found was very important. And everyone in Europe knew. And they, these, these journals, these uh, uh, books about, of Columbus's reports about what had happened circulated all over Europe. The amazing thing is they would put a picture on the frontispiece of this, of these books, and it was done in all, a number of different languages. And what picture would they put on the front? Ferdinand. <laughs> and Columbus said that Ferdinand had not been interested at all in the discoveries. Yes. I, s I was always kind of um, intrigued how you went from Francis Perkins to Isabel. I mean, I think some of us in the Women's History Discussion Group are just in all of your. Um, your <laughs> of my <favorite>. stupidity? <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess. So, but surely, did you find some similarities? Well, it's funny. I think women who have done who have done things look back at history to other women. And one of the things when I was doing the Frances Perkins book, uh, Sinclair Lewis, who had been a boyfriend of Frances Perkins, um, wrote a biography of a, a faux biog a, a, a fictionalized account of a woman social worker who became a government official and her sexual exploits, uh, which was not very nice to do to the sitting Secretary of Labor. Um, and, uh, but he talked about the girl, the social worker, <coughs> running through the fields, not sure whether she wanted to be Columbus or Isabel. Mm -hmm. So as I was doing that, I thought, okay, what was in her mind was Isabel, was how did a woman do something? How did a woman change the world? How did a woman do this? She was playing with that idea, and then it turned out that her her own, uh, a relative of her family came to live with them, and he had lost his arm at the, ba the Battle of Fair Oaks. I guess he'd lost his right arm, and so he had to have somebody write for him. He was a writer, but he had to have somebody write for him. And so um, he was writing a book, a history, he was writing a history of Queen Isabella, and, is, and, and Francis Perkins was actually the scribe for her uncle when he was writing that book. So that sort of was like, wow, this is kind of weird. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, so I've, I've become a, a great believer that um, uh, the fates put breadcrumbs out for you, and you have to be looking. You have to be looking for them, and that's how I think I did it. But I had no idea how really, really difficult it was going to be. A yes. Companion question: um, Are there any American historians who were interested in Isabella among all those that study Spain? Uh, well, there's a, a a woman who's done very fine work that did a lot of her work here, named Peggy Liss, and I used her books religiously, you might say, <laughs> while I was doing my book. I would refer to it frequently. She did very good research. She did a, 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 the 2004 version of her book is my favorite. And so I, I, I uh, depended on her. The other person that I used very much was William Hickling Prescott, who wrote a biography of Isabel in the early 1800s. And his picture, there's a painting of him right outside of rare books and manuscripts so on the second floor. So next time you go there, salute him, OK? He did this massive research into Isabel and Ferdinand's history, um, partially blind. And, uh, and he still, I mean, we've learned much in the last 200 years that uh, he didn't know when he wrote his book in the, in the early 1800s. But there's a beauty in the language that lasts today, and somehow he caught the spirit of the time so beautifully that that was another thing. That's another Library of Congress associated thing, so tip your hat to the painting when you go by next time. Yes? Can you explain um, the relationship between the daughter of Catherine of Aragon? Why did she go to England? Um, um, the, the, uh, the Tudors had a very weak claim to the English throne. Um, they had uh, basically muscled their way into the English throne. And they wanted to marry their son into someone who had a, a long noble descent. And Isabel was descended from uh, John of Gaunt and, and Catherine of Lancaster. Um, and um, so she had English blood that had, was royal blood in Spain. And so what it was is it was a connection between the two countries, and it was also bluer blood than the Tudors had. So he really, the, uh, King Henry VII, really, 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 really wanted one of Isabel's daughters for his oldest son. And he married Catherine, the youngest, to his oldest son, who died. And the next son, Henry VIII, ended up marrying his uh, brother's widow, and much merriment ensued. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.